So we're continuing our series through our vision and values. Um, we're a few weeks in now, lost track a little bit, I think five weeks in or so. Um, and we've looked at grace and power, the first two values. And today we're looking at our third value of six, which is authenticity. So that will be this week and next week, authenticity. So <coughs> I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear the word authenticity. It's like a bit, lot of these words, they're one word and probably all sorts of things uh, come to our minds. For me, when, we, when, we're, when we're having this value as authenticity, what we're meaning by that at its heart is that we want to be a church where we have genuine, deep, real relationships with one another. Because without that, in my view, there's no real church because real church. Yes, we've been looking at our upward values and how it's God is power, there's power and there's grace and it's us and God. There's this amazing stuff. But there's also church isn't just me and God in my one just individual thing. But it is us and God is us together in relationship with one another, growing in relationship with God. And so we want these actual real relationships with one another, not just um, I happen to be sitting next to you on a Sunday morning, but actually I'm starting to get to know you and I'm involved in your life and you're involved in my life. And so really this, this value of authenticity is grounded in the biblical truth of what the church is. We looked at power. When we looked at power, we said it was grounded in the biblical truth that church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's the dwelling place of God. And this authenticity value is grounded in the truth that the church is the family of God. It's not just the temple of God, it is also the family of God. Uh, we see that in a few times in the New Testament. One example is Ephesians 2 verse 19. It says, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Or we could translate that as family, members of his household, his family. We aren't, aren't foreigners, aren't, aren't aliens anymore. We, we, we've, we've been brought in to know God. That word alien is a bit strange. We're not foreigners. It's just a word they use in the Bible. <laughs> we're definitely not aliens in the sense that you're probably thinking of now. <laughs> but we're not foreigners either. We have been brought close to God. So now we know God, but also we've been brought together with his family as his people. You see, when I become a Christian, when you become a Christian, what happens is something amazing. Many amazing things happen, actually, all at once. Uh, you're forgiven of your sin immediately and completely for everything you've ever done wrong and ever will do wrong. Uh, you're, you're given the hope of everlasting life, which is guaranteed and cannot be taken from you. But also you're adopted into the family of God and he becomes your dad in heaven and you become his child. But not only that. Because I'm his child and you're his child, we're children together. And so uh, <laughs> we have relationships with one another. We're brothers and sisters. Not only do we have a perfect father in heaven who is perfect. Some of us might have bad or, 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 or understandings of fathers which aren't good. Or maybe we've never really known our father. Our God in heaven is perfect. He is the perfect father. He will never let you down. He will never do anything wrong. So we have this relationship with him, but also with other brothers and sisters who have the, who have the same father in heaven. That's amazing. When you actually stop and think about it, you are born into this new spiritual family. That's why the church is so important. Well, it's one of the reasons the church is so important. Because the church, as I've said before, isn't simply a building you go to. It's not simply an organisation that you're a part of. It is a family that you belong to. That is so core to who we are as Redeemer Church. That we're a family, that we belong to family. For some of us, we might have really strong biological families that we know well and, and, that, and that doesn't may, maybe doesn't have quite the same impact for others of us we may not and and actually the idea of belonging to us to a, to a new family is something which grips us and I, I pray it would for each one of us be something which is deeply deeply significant and as we um, look through the book of acts which this series is principally based in uh, we see this um this idea of family and commitment to one another um, come out in this word that's used called fellowship. It's a bit of a strange word. We don't really use it much. Churches have tended to use it over the years for when you're having a cup of tea with someone. Uh, but actually, it doesn't mean about it doesn't mean having a cup of tea with someone. Fellowship is very different. To having a cup of tea with someone. Fellowship means this 
deep sharing with one another. It's, it, there's a root, it comes from the root um, of sharing. So there's this deep sharing with one another. Acts 2 verse 42 says this. They, that's the early church, the early Christians, devoted themselves to fellowship. That's quite strong to devote yourself to this thing. They weren't devoting themselves to having a nice cup of tea every now and then. They were devoting themselves to, uh, to committed sharing lives with one another. Devoted themselves to it. And so as a family, as Redeemer Church, we want to be a people who are devoting ourselves to these kinds of committed relationships with one another and the amazing thing is we're not united as a family around our preferences we might all have different um things that we like to music that we like to listen to different tv that we like to watch different um different preferences we have that's that's not what we're that's not what we're uniting around we're not, not uniting around our background we all have very different backgrounds we, we're not uniting around our ethnicity we're not uniting around our social status. We're a, a, a mixed group of people, but we're not just a group of people. We are a family that God has called together to love one another, to be there for one another. And we are united around Jesus Christ. Galatians 3 verse 28 says, you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is this unity and togetherness, this fellowship, this sharing, which comes around the person of Jesus Christ. I think it's amazing. Have you ever stopped to think how, how weirdly different we are in Redeemer Church? Every now and then I just think, wow. <laughs> Actually, it's more than every now and then. Quite often I think, wow, this is this is amazing. We are all so different. And that's why sometimes we, uh, we slightly rub each other up the wrong way. But that's OK, because families do that. <laughs> but we're united, not around us all being the same, but around Jesus Christ. And so that's kind of like a long introduction to give kind of the biblical grounding, the biblical context for this idea of this value of authenticity It's rooted in this thing of family, the church's family and called to have fellowship sharing with one another. And so there's three particular things I want us to look at that we're called to share in together, to have this fellowship um, that kind of causes fellowship to come about and, and cause authenticity to come about. Firstly, we're called to share our time. Later on in Acts chapter two, uh, where it says they were devoted to fellowship, it says in verse 40, 46, Every day they continue to meet together. So the first point is pretty basic, um, but it's also pretty significant. You can't have authentic, deep relationships with one another if you never spend time with one another. That's I mean, we know that, don't we? I mean, many of us maybe have been distanced from family members over this time, over this last year. But we have still a lot of us have, have reverted to. Uh, FaceTime or Zoom or whatever to keep some kind of relationship, some kind of connection with our family, because we know if we had go a whole year or a long time without any kind of time together, then um, those relationships are going to distance. There's going to be a lack of openness, a lack of honesty. And so if we want that kind of authentic relationship, we actually need to commit to give time to one another. One image we could um, use is to think of our lives as like islands. So we naturally uh, live as islands. We naturally um, live quite independent lives. We kind of is can isolate ourselves from other people. That's often the way um, we go, especially when things are hard, especially when things are difficult. We kind of maybe look in on ourselves and, and build these kind of um, barriers around us and become islands. But as I spend time with you and as you spend time with me and we, we, we develop this relationship, what happens is it's like a bridge develops between the island of my life and the island of your life. And we start to experience um, the, the reality of being able to carry things over that bridge. 
So without the bridge of, of time and relationship being built over time, it's hard to have any kind of openness and honesty and realness. But as I spend time with you, this bridge starts to form between my island and your island, and we start to be able to actually share things and, and, and open up about what's going on and trust one another. Or to put it another way, you could say that, that um, spending time together, sharing our time with others is a little bit like um, the nutrients in the soil of our lives that allow authenticity to grow. So me spending time with you is, and you spending time with me, and, and is, is valuable. It's not something to just say, oh, I'll have a quick, I'll have a quick chat on Zoom on a Sunday morning, or I'll quick, I'll just quickly say hello on, on, on a Sunday morning, then move on. If that's all you ever do, if that's all the relationships that you develop in the church become, and that's the limit of them, then you're going to struggle to develop authentic, real, honest relationships with others. Now, uh, some of you are probably thinking, wow, the early church met together every day. That doesn't sound very practical for me. I work five days a week. Maybe some of us work six days. I, uh, I have children I've got to look after in the evenings and I'm busy and I've got to have some time for myself. How on earth am I going to be able to give time, invest, share time with others, with this spiritual family, as well as all the other commitments I've got? And I just want to say that the way we read Acts isn't to, isn't to say I've got to copy every single detail of what's written in Acts, because Acts isn't an instruction manual. Acts is a story of what God did in the early church. On the other hand, we don't just ignore Acts and say, well, it's got no relevance to speak into our lives today. It's the story of what God did. And there are principles in Acts that we need to take for today to enable us to thrive as churches today. And so the principle, I think, I don't think we have to say, um, we need to spend time with another with, with, with the church every single day of the week. But I do think we need to take the principle that church is not just a Sunday thing. Church is not just attend a meeting, uh, watch someone speak to me from the front, go home and then spend the rest of my week on my own. Come back next Sunday, do the same again. That is not church. The principle we take is that real relationships need to be formed. Time needs to be spent with one another. And, you know, you can. You can do that in the midst of your already busy schedules. This isn't just another thing to add into your busy schedule. How are you? We've, got, we've all got to eat three meals a day. How are you drawing? OK, admittedly, this might be harder at the moment or you can still do it over Zoom at times. But how are you? How are you inviting others into some of your meal times during the week? Or um, we've all got to. Uh, we, well, we haven't all got to. We all often in, are involved in various leisure act activities. Maybe we, we go to the beach on the weekend every now and then. How are you inviting others from the church family into what you're doing in that leisure activity? You know, there are lots of things that we do where we just can just open up our lives and the island of our lives and stop, being, stop thinking it's all about just me and my own biological family and actually invite others into it. And as, though, that as we spend time with others, we start to build these bridges where authenticity can develop and grow. One of the absolute blessings for us uh, in the Scott household over the last year has been having Penny bubble with us. And uh, it's been a blessing because, as you'll all know, who you know her, Penny is amazing. And uh, it's been a real blessing because it's taught us so much more. Having Penny in our lives much more than we she was in our lives before, but we've been able to have her in our lives um, uh, much more over this last year. Every Sunday, she's been spending the day with us, and we've been eating, we've been sharing, and we've been we haven't hidden the we haven't hidden the bad bits of our lives. She's seen all the rubbish, I'm sure, uh, in how we parent, all the things that we do wrong, all the bad things we say, uh, as well as the good stuff. Hopefully, she's she's seen some good stuff. Um, but there's, we've just been open and we haven't sort of said, oh, this is our, we're going to be on best behavior now, Penny's here, we've just been who we are. And uh, it's been amazing. And it's taught us more about what it means to be authentic community where we're just being with one another and, and, and she's been able to share and we've been able to share and it's been a real blessing. And so the question for all of us really on this first point is how are we inviting others in our church family into our weekly schedules? How are we investing time in our weekly schedules to draw others from our family into it? So that's sharing our time. Pretty basic, but pretty significant starting point if we're going to be authentic. Secondly, share our needs. Acts 2 verse 45 and Acts 4 verse 35 have 
a little phrase exactly the same in both verses where it says this. They gave to anyone who had need. To anyone who had need. There's a very important phrase there. Anyone who had need. The church back then was full of people who have needs. The church today is full of people who have needs because we're human beings. And things happen in our lives. I mean, we have a need. But I wonder, how did how did the early church know that these people had needs? Presumably, someone stuck their hand up and said, I've got a problem here. I need some help. I need in this case, it was financial support. But I need some I need some support financially. You see, if we're going to be an authentic community, we need to be willing to share the needs that we have in our lives with other people in our community. We do not suffer in silence. The last thing we want in Redeemer Church to have a group of people who are just on their own saying, I've got this problem. I just can't tell anyone about it. No, we want you to share the needs that you've got so that others can come around you and support you. Ultimately, it's going to be tricky to do it unless people know, unless God reveals by prophetic words, which, of course, is possible. But it'd be a, it, he's also given us mouths to share when the needs are, uh, are present with one another. And we want to be a community where that's just normal. As many of you will have gathered, if not all of you, uh, I'm not from the northeast originally um I, i've now lived here a total of almost 13 years so I'm, i feel I, I love the northeast and i feel like it's my true home um but uh, unfortunately i haven't developed the accent but maybe that will come one day probably not probably got here too late um but <laughs> soon, soon i love i love the accent but soon after um uh moving up here uh well a couple of years after moving up here um a uh, a friend of mine in the church at the time uh said shy bands getting out and uh, <laughs> the context for that was uh i was about to start an internship for the church and uh needed to raise some money to be able to live on for the year and i was a bit nervous about asking people in the church for money because it felt a bit of a weird thing to do and he's strong he's a, he's a man who likes to bring strong challenge so he strongly challenged me <laughs> saying shy bands getting out I think he wrote a blog about it, actually, at the time. And it's really stuck with me. And the reality is that unless someone knows that I have a problem, that I need this, that I've got this issue, they, it is hard for them to help me. And so let's be this community who say, come on, let's let's not pretend. Let's take off these masks that we lo love to wear. And let's just be open and honest and authentic, saying, come on, we're in this together. We're on this journey together. I've got this need. Can you help me? The person might say, no, I can't. That's fine. Maybe there's someone else who can help them help you. It's not... Um, but let's let's just make that natural for us. And I could say um, a lot more on this, but rather than me say it, um, I decided to turn back to a blog that my very wise wife wrote uh, about five years ago, just as we we're about to start the church in Chester Street uh, for, I don't know, yeah, five years ago, probably almost. Um, um, so she wrote this. Building strong foundations of community challenges me to put off the I don't want to bother anyone mentality which can so easily plague my tight-laced Britishness. Sure having deep and rich friendships with those you're sharing life with is a wonderful and God-given thing but you have to be prepared to share the snotty bits you'll know she likes that phrase if you know her to share the snotty bits and to choose to allow others to help you. So often we don't want to share because we think this challenge or that struggle doesn't really matter or others have much worse going on or it makes me look like a failure. But that's what family is like. Family is coming down the stairs in the morning when your bed with your bed hair on full display and sporting your favourite but shrunken pyjamas and dry dribble on your chin. With your family, there's no need to make yourself look decent before going downstairs to make your morning wake up cup of tea or coffee. You just go as you are. This is how Jesus wants us. This is how he wants us to live with one another. Real, genuine. It might look like choosing to not let pride and self-sufficiency build walls around myself so I don't allow others to see the I'm struggling days. For others, it might look like sharing with someone else that actually having a few extra home-cooked meals over the week will be an absolute blessing as you're moving house and it would just take one thing off your mind. For others, it might mean saying that you and your spouse really need some time together to have some um, so have someone look after the kids. For others still, it might look like choosing to keep sharing the same prayer request because it's still something that God has placed on your heart and you need to see his victory over 
and you need strength to persevere. All of these choices require vulnerability. Choosing to say yes to following Jesus and not being afraid to open up a little bit of ourselves. Can I urge us to be a church who regularly, happily say, I'm in need. Will you help me? Would that be normal? Can that be normal for us? That's what we want. That's part of what we mean by authenticity. And if there's, we put structures in place to try and help that. We have community groups in our church. I know this happens a lot already in community groups. Let's have it more uh, in our community groups. If you're not part of one, please let us know if you want to join one. Um, but it's not all about the structures. That's just one thing we, we're putting in. But, but just share with whoever you're in those relationships with. So share our time, share our needs. And thirdly and finally, share our weaknesses. So I'm just going to put it out there at this, at, at this point, um, as I'm sure you're all well aware, I'm a very weak person. I come face to face with my sin uh, and the sin in my heart regularly, and I don't particularly like what I see. I uh, regularly am pretty weary and exhausted. Uh, I go through desert times in my life, spiritually and emotionally, just like anyone else does, if they're honest with themselves and with others. And the reality is, I'm saying that not because I want you to feel sorry for me. I'm saying that because I want you to realise, which I'm sure you do, but just in case you don't, that I am human just like you. That we're all human together. And because we're human, part of being human is that we have weakness. Because part of being human means we are, we are flesh and blood people. We are not God. We're not supermen and superwomen. And so we have weaknesses and we have failings and we fall short. Uh, Paul has this little phrase in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 where he speaks about us having treasure in jars of clay. And that image of us as humans being jars of clay, I, I just find really helpful. We have treasure. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the gospel, uh, which I think are both of which what he means by that treasure. Uh, but it's contained in us who are jars of clay, weak, fragile humans. So the big question is, if we are all humans and we're all weak. Why do we pretend that we're not? Why, when we meet together with other Christians, are we all pretending in one, with one another? Why in our community groups is there not more of, I'm really doubting at the moment. I'm really walking through this dry ground, this dry land at the moment. I'm really struggling. I'm, I'm feeling so weary and exhausted at the moment. Now, I'm sure that does happen, but I'm sure that it could happen a lot more. If we're honest with ourselves, I'm sure we don't share that as much community groups or times we meet together are too often push, putting forward our strengths and all the good stuff about us and presenting a good image and not often enough I believe really allowing the deep things that are going on in our hearts and our lives the struggles to be out there you see if I don't if I pretend if I'm not honest with you and you're not honest with me and we're not honest with one another what happens is we're kind of robbing the body of Christ the opportunity to be the tangible grace and love of Jesus towards one another. You see, Jesus is full of grace and he has called you and me to represent that grace and that love to others. And as someone shares openly about their, their, their weaknesses, I, I can come with the grace and love of Jesus. It's not about condemning one another. It's about saying, OK, yeah, we're on the journey together. And here's, here's the gospel. Here's the good news of Jesus for you in the midst of your weakness. But I need to be able to share that weakness for that kind of stuff to happen. And one of the biggest, well, not one of the biggest weakness we all have is this little thing. It's actually a big thing, but it's a little word called sin. And there's a verse which I'm not sure how much we've spoken about it or taught on it uh, in the church over the years, certainly not our church much. And it's this verse in James chapter five, verse 16, where it says, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other. Confess your sins to one another. In other words, put your weaknesses out there on display, the biggest weakness, your sin, for, to others and say, this is really an issue in my life right now. What gives sin its greatest power is when it remains unconfessed to God and to other people. 
God's the one who forgives, but he uses other people to extend his forgiveness in a, in a kind of, as I say, tangibly show and demonstrate his forgiveness to you. And there is a real freedom, not by, you don't have to stand up in front of church and say, here's the list of all the things I've done wrong this week, church. We're not going to do that every week. But you can, with one or two other trusted friends, say, this is really struggling. I'm really struggling in this area, in this sin, this, this thought pattern, this, this selfish um, way of doing things, these angry words, whatever it may be. And I need you to come and help me and, and pray for me and bring the grace and the gospel of Jesus to me in this. And just uh again i'm going to quote someone else because sometimes you just read something and you think wow that says it better than i could so uh, there's a, a um, dietrich bonhoeffer uh, many of you were, would have heard of uh, who stood up to the nazi regime in germany says this in his book in life together you cannot hide from god the mask you wear in the presence of other people won't get you anywhere in the presence of god god wants to see you as you are he wants to be gracious to you you don't have to go on lying to yourself and to other Christians as if you were without sin. You're allowed to be a sinner. Thank God for, get, for that. God loves the sinner but hates the sin. In confession, there takes place a breakthrough to community. Sin wants to be alone with people. It takes them away from the community. The more lonely people become, the more destructive the power of sin over them. Sin that has been spoken and confessed has lost all of its power. We can admit our sins and in this very act, find community for the first time. In our church, we have these things called fight clubs. Again, just a structure. We're encouraging people, groups of two to four people in the same sex to a meeting regularly. And part of those times together should be that you're sharing the areas of sin and struggle uh, and hearing the gospel spoken over you so that you can grow together. Not you're condemned, but so that together you are on the journey growing. And this is a problem for leaders uh, this uh, as much as anyone else. And um, I, just, I just thought I'd just read this verse from Paul. He says uh, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 3, great lead, he says this, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. I love that verse because here's a man who's really authentic. Here's a man who was one of the greatest leaders who's ever lived, but also said he was full of weakness. He was even full of fear and trembling as he came before the church. And leaders as much as anyone else, and I'm not just talking about churches. You may be a leader in your business. You may be a leader in, in whatever area of life you're in. You're as weak as anyone else. We're on this journey together. It's not like some people have made it and others are a bit behind. We're all on the journey together. So let's just be real. Let's just be authentic with one another about our struggles. As we draw to a close, I just want to say this value of authenticity is deeply rooted in the gospel of Jesus. Because the truth is, we have a father God in heaven who knows us deeply and intimately. We can't pretend, as Bonhoeffer said, we can't hide from him because he already knows what's on our heart anyway. We can try and hide, but you can't really get very far with that. He knows all the weaknesses. He knows all the frailties. He knows all the struggles. And he still loves you in and through his son, Jesus Christ. He is still for you in and through his son, Jesus Christ, because nothing can can rob you of that love of God. And so because we can be real and we can be open and honest with God, our father in heaven, so we should also be real with our brothers and sisters, because as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are called to demonstrate the unconditional love and welcome and acceptance that God in heaven gives to us, to one another. We don't have to hide our sins away. We don't have to hide our needs away. We don't have to hide our struggles away because God loves you in Jesus, because God is still for you. And so as we understand the gospel and that actually what that means is that I have, I'm free. So I don't have to pretend I can take off my mask with God and I can take off my mask with others in my church family and I can just be real. So let's just be real. Let's just be honest. Let's just be open with one another. Who are you building authentic relationships with in the church family right now? Maybe there's some tweaks in our schedules. Maybe there's 
a, a bit of boldness to be a bit open with our needs and our sins and our weaknesses than we are currently. I don't know what it looks like for you, but let's make, take that next step of real authenticity with one another. If you're new to the church and you want to kind of see what that might mean for you to be involved, we'd love to be able to, obviously we can't necessarily see you at the moment, so we'd love to be able to see you on Zoom or something. So please do make contact with us. Uh, info at redeemercls.com is the place to go. And we'd love to be able to uh, connect with you so that we can build you into this family that God has established. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you're for us. Thank you that your love is unconditional, Lord, in all of our weaknesses, in all of our sin, in all of our frailties, Lord. Thank you that you declare over our lives in Jesus. If anyone confesses their sin, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, that as we we can be real and honest with you because we don't we don't uh, there's not a kind of threat of being struck down when we're open. Lord, you already know our hearts and you love us. And thank you, Lord, that we can be real and open with one another. Thank you. We have brothers and sisters to journey with us on this strange but beautiful thing called life. And Lord, I pray that you would help us take our next steps on that journey. I pray for each one of us, Lord, that you would help us uh, open up that little bit more, to be more authentic, to be more trusting, Lord. Yeah, take us on, Lord, on this journey, we ask. Amen.